In this lesson, I'm going to comment on a number of different graphical representations of data. For each graph, I'm going to try and name the type of graph and see if I can describe the data as discrete or continuous or cross-sectional or time series. And I'll also be identifying some of the positive and negative features about each graph. Starting with a couple of graphs which both have bars on them. But the first noticeable difference between the two is that this graph has gaps between the bars. And therefore it is a column graph or a bar chart whereas no gaps between the columns indicates that this is a histogram. Now a histogram is usually used for continuous data and that's usually when we're measuring something, in this case the height in feet of some black cherry trees. With the column graph we're not actually dealing with numerical data at all, this is categorical data and each column represents the percentage of sugar in each of the products listed. So to answer the question here, how much sugar is in chocolate cake? We go to the chocolate cake column and we've got 30.3% sugar in chocolate cake. However, there are some problems with this graph because we're not really comparing like with like. Just because a chocolate cake contains 30% sugar, it doesn't actually tell us how much we're going to eat if we have a piece of that cake. Ketchup contains 8.8% sugar, but when we eat ketchup, we're not eating this product in the same sort of quantities that we might eat chocolate cake. But there is some helpful information. We can see that of these products, the chocolate bar contains the highest percentage of sugar and the ketchup contains the lowest percentage of sugar. But we really need more information about the products before this graph can be very useful. On the other hand, we have the heights of black cherry trees and this is a frequency histogram. So we can see from the graph how many trees were measured. But there's no information here about where the trees are or how old the trees are. But we can see that the modal class for cherry trees is the 75 to 80 feet height. Next we have a 3D pie chart and a back-to-back -back stem and leaf plot. With the pie chart, we have to be careful using these 3D representations. They do look very effective, but unfortunately tilting the chart on its side like this does overemphasize whichever category is at the front and make it appear to have a bigger angle. That said, this chart does give all of the proportions and the amounts that each section represents. It does look like the amounts of money have been rounded and there's no indication here of what is being sold. But visually we can see that for this company North America generates the biggest proportion of sales revenue and Australia generates the smallest proportion of sales revenue. With the back-to-back -back stem and leaf plot, this is quite a nice way of comparing two sets of data. Now I said before that when we're measuring, that usually means we have continuous data. But with pulse rate, we're counting the number of beats per minute. And when we're counting, that's discrete data. A stem and leaf plot can be used for either discrete or continuous data. So the back-to-back -back plot shows us that before exercise the pulse rates ranged from 50 to 79 and after exercise the pulse rates ranged from 59 to 92. What we're not given here is a key. 
we can assume from the fact that it's pulse rates that 92 means 92 beats per minute because that's what pulse rate is usually measured in. But really this should be stated on the graph. We can also assume here that this is the same group of people, although this is not stated on the graph. And we have no information about whether this is males, females, the age of participants. Again, we really need more information before this data can actually be useful. But visually, we can see that pulse rates have increased after exercise. Now we have another bar graph with categorical data and a stem and leaf plot. The bar graph has five different activities and each bar shows the number. There really isn't enough information for this graph to be useful. Is this the number of people, number of hours? Can people respond to more than one activity or are they just saying which is their favourite or which they do most on a Saturday? So this graph needs a much more detailed title than just number. Graph titles really should be quite long, a whole sentence that indicates the type of graph, what is being measured and who is being measured. So this should be something like bar graph showing the total number of hours that 10 teenagers spent on five different activities last week. The stem and leaf plot gives the infant mortality rates in Western Africa and we have numbers ranging from 51 to 151 but the lack of a key makes this very hard to use. Is that 51 per thousand babies or per ten thousand? Is it 5.1 percent? And what does each number represent? Is each number a different country in Western Africa or a different year in the whole of Western Africa? So again we need a much more detailed title and a key in order to make this graph useful. Now we have two quite different types of graph. Firstly, a pictograph or a pictogram. We're given a key which says that each coloured circle represents two student votes and each student has chosen their favourite colour. So we can see that there are three and a half circles for red, which means that seven students chose red, two chose yellow, and so on. This is a really nice visual representation of the data because the circles are coloured with the chosen colour and you can easily see that blue is the most popular and that orange and yellow were both the least popular colour with this group of students. The line graph is used here to represent time series data and the key here tells us that we have Two sets of data, the problems caused by bugs and the problems caused by security holes for Microsoft at work. Now this question says how much did problems due to bugs cost Microsoft in 1999? And that's represented by this point here, 1999. If we try and read across, approximately 3,000. But the key for the problems axis doesn't say that this is the cost of the problems, nor does it say that it's the number of problems. So we need to be really careful here. Can we answer this question? If this is the cost of problems, then we can say that it's approximately $3,000. But if it's the number of problems, then we need more information in order to be able to answer that question. Another couple of things to look out for when analysing graphs. Firstly, does the scale start at zero? In this example of UK population, 
The graph is constructed to show a dramatic increase in population. But if we were to plot these points on a scale that did start at zero, the first point is just below 58,000 and the last point is close to 62,000. That increase does not look anywhere near as dramatic. So in mathematics we always try to start our scales at zero. You sometimes see that uh, there'll, there'll be a, a zero with a little squiggle to show that there's a gap in the scale. But the problem with this is you can't read off the axis intercept and it gives a false idea of the steepness of the graph. So wherever possible, you should start your scales at zero and evenly space the numbers along the axis. This divided bar graph shows the distribution of a population by age and by gender. The blue sections are the numbers of males and the red sections are the numbers of females. Aside from the obvious lack of a title here, there's another problem with this data in that the age categories are not consistent. The 35 to 44, 45 to 54 and 55 to 64 are fine, but then we have this category of under 35, which it has a much bigger width than the other categories. It looks from the columns that there are more under 35s than there are people who are in the 55 to 64 age group. But then we're dealing with a category which is three times as wide as the 55 to 64 age group. So it's important to make sure that your vertical scale starts at zero and is evenly spaced, and that if you have grouped data, the groups are of even width if you're wanting to compare them in some way. To conclude this lesson, I'd like you to pause the video and write down as much as you can about the data represented by these two graphs. Include words such as discrete, continuous, cross-sectional and time series. Give the type of graph and also suggest a possible title for each graph. What could these graphs represent? And also, what could the scales be labelled as?